okay guys I was just recording this and apparently I was talking for about 10 minutes and it, I hadn't hit the record button so I felt like an idiot okay but I was also like checking like okay it's recording this time okay okay so this is the lecture for to accompany the PowerPoint the genus homo so I noticed a small mistake it, or that I made in your syllabus um, that it says that we're gonna be covering early homo um, and I think what I was I think what I was thinking was that oh I'll do early homo one day and later homo another day um, but then when I ended up making the syllabus like and I filled it all in I just I guess I decided not to do that but I forgot to switch you know the change the name to just have it all in one day so the PowerPoint is it's 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 early homo and it's late it's like all of homo okay so in case you were you guys can figure it out I'm confident I'm confident in you guys okay um so slide two so we're just gonna go right into it. Slide two, the genus Homo. So you can see uh, the picture on the side. So this is, you know, similar to those other pictures that I had had, I had in the, the previous PowerPoints on the um, early genera and, uh, oh, oh man, the Australopithecines and Paranthropines that, uh, you know, you see you can have that visual of, you know, chimps, humans, last common ancestor. Like I like to have, like it's not, it's not specifically correct because it's just my little drawing, but to me, I like to have, especially when it comes to things like when there's a time scale of some sort, I like to have a visual to like, okay, we were here and then we're moving here and here and here. Like I like to have it. So that's why I kind of made this for you just so you have a very, very general idea of like how we're kind of moving through time, moving along that lineage. Okay, so we talked about those early genera. You can see in the, in the photo, we talked about those early genera. Then we talked about the paranthropines and Australopithecines. And now we're gonna be talking about the genus Homo. So, and that'll bring us up to, to humans. So uh, I know I mentioned this to you guys before, but the reason you know we're, we're we are talking about some of these you know, the biological stuff is because when we start talking about modern humans and culture, we have to understand where a lot of this kind of started evolutionarily, whether it's cultural or biological. That we have to kind of you know look back at our lineage and say, okay, this is when we see these things starting, and this is why we see this later in our species. Whether it's something cultural or social or or you know biological, anatomical, we have to kind of backtrack to see that the reasons why. So. I'm, Hoping you guys understand that. And as we kind of go through stuff later, I'll be referencing some of the stuff that we talked about here in this section. You're like, oh, okay, that makes sense because of this, and you know. So, okay. So, we had talked about those early genera, and if you can recall, you know, we there were the pictures I had shown you of the skulls, and there were descriptions, but if you can recall the those pictures of the skulls, and then those Smithsonian recreations were pretty good. Um, how do we differentiate those, you know, even though we, I know we talked about them very briefly, but how do we differentiate those from what we're going to be talking about now, this group, which of which we are a member, our designation is Homo sapiens, so we are the genus Homo, um, so we're in this genus. But So what, what differentiates this group from the other groups that we were talking about? So remember that we're all hominins. We talked about that, you know, about six million years ago, we split from chimpanzees. They or from a last common ancestor, eventually that line, you know, evolved into chimpanzees, and now we have humans. But along the way, in our lineage, there were a bunch of different species, and we talked very, very briefly about some of those. Um, and we talked about how those the the suite of traits, the um, the those six traits that characterize hominins. Um, but also recall that I told you it's not as if they all suddenly happened at the same time or they occurred at the same rate. We're gonna see, you know, some some shifts through time. So anyway, so how do we differentiate hominin oh my gosh, homo from the other genera? So you can see here in this list, it's you know, we're starting to see larger brains. Um it's not as if there's a major huge jump in brain. Well, it's pretty quick, but you'll see this in a second. We do see definitely an increase in brain size. Um skulls are also getting a little more round, which is interesting. I'll have some pictures of that. Faces are getting smaller, so we're seeing more of that. Um, um, why am I blanking? Less prognathism. Oh my gosh, I'm not starting this one over. <laughs> the words are right in front of you, Alicia. Okay. Just learn to read. And then, of course, no crusting, um, like we had seen like in the paranthropines, for example. Okay. Slide three. So you'll see this nice list of some of the species we're going to talk about. Some I'll just briefly talk about, and then a few others we'll probably spend a little more time on. And, um, oh, so this picture right here. So I know like the, you probably watched the other PowerPoints or, you know, lectures days ago, but if you can recall from your mind or if you pull it up right now, 
if you remember those, the Australopithecines and Paranthropines, if you can kind of visualize that compared to the picture you're seeing on this PowerPoint right here, um, you'll see that, you'll hopefully you'll notice that for this one, this is Homo erectus, that the brain, the, the area of the skull where the brain would be is a bit bigger, the face is a bit flat, uh, you know, less prognathic. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of these in more detail. So like I said, these are the, these are the species we will be covering. Okay, so the first one is Homo habilis. Now I have the date there, um, and, and as you know, with having already taken the first exam, I'm not, uh, like you have access to your notes in your book and all that stuff. Um, I'm never gonna ask you to focus on something very specific about the dates, I just have them there for your reference. I hope that you, at the end of the section, have a general understanding of kind of the general timeline of maybe a couple species along the way and the evolutionary, like biological, anatomical trends that we see, like brains getting bigger, like stuff like that, like some, some general over, overview of the ideas I hope you have and a general chronology of things, but you know, the exact dates or something, don't, don't, stress, don't stress about that. Okay, so here we have Homo habilis, known for using what we have named Oldowan tools, so a very specific type of tool. In fact, this is um, one of the reasons that when this um, specimen was first discovered, they thought, okay, this is different from what we've seen before. This species clearly was using tools, there were many tools found at, at these sites. And um, so it, to the paleoanthropologist's minds, it was, this is clearly a designation that's different in terms of like what they were doing, um, maybe their cognition, intellect, um, how they were manipulating things culturally. And so, but you might be thinking, well, just because they didn't find evidence of the other species using tools doesn't mean they weren't. That's true. But we find so many with them and we don't find any before. Now, could very likely based on what even the little that you and that we all talked about uh, about the paranthropines and the um, australopithecines and the types of foods they were eating they are very likely using some type of tool maybe made from wood or something like that it would be weird if for anyone any paleoanthropologist to say they weren't using any kind of tool because we see like modern chimps you know using using tools of, of different kinds um but we do know that that we definitely see stone tools with homo habilis and then and then after homo habilis we see very complex stone tools so this is you know gen generally where we would say oh here's like the tool cut off from from what we know now um brain size is getting a bit bigger um now we have you know a slight uh slightly less prognathism so um more of that parabolic dental arch that we talked about and you can see here in this picture the nice uh smithsonian recreation which if you can uh, compare it kind of compare it to what what we had talked about before, those those different Smithsonian recreations of like the Australopithecines and Paranthropines that looked tended to look more ancestral. We see this kind of, you know, not looking as, as ancestral in that sense. So that's kind of interesting. Not that there's a goal towards looking like, there's no goal, or there's no goal for things to get to a human or get to a Neanderthal or whatever. We know that, like we can look back and say, okay, that's what happened. And so we can kind of look at those trends and be like, interesting, I see this as, you know, that's all I meant by that. Not that there's a goal towards any of that and then you see the skull the picture of the skull um, a little bit of a forehead nothing like a modern human not that there's a goal towards having a forehead but just in terms of like if we're looking at that specific trend because um, we know it happened that we start to see a little bit of a forehead with homo habilis brain is still small uh, like not anything compared to a modern human or neanderthal or you know hydroparkensis but it's definitely larger Okay, so slide five, you'll see. Um, so Homo habilis versus Homo rudolfensis. So this isn't, I just kind of want you guys to be aware of this. This isn't really a debate among paleoanthropologists anymore, but it definitely was. Um, so when, I and mean, this is true for a lot of different scientific fields, when you're the first one to find something or when you've only found a few specimens, it's hard to really know a lot. Like you have to make a lot of conjecture, which you know, people do. And then you hope that, you know, as you get more evidence information, you process um, the evidence in different ways that you will be able to have more data and more information. And, but sometimes, you know, you have to, you work with what you have. And at this time, like imagine, you know, decades ago when there wasn't a lot of information, people had a lot of different ideas, which is totally fine. That's also part of science too. Well, one of the ideas was that when they first saw Homo habilis and what had been designated as Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, um, which we, we would say now, at the time, people really debated, okay, is it two different species or is it one? If it's one, it could just be that it's, there's just, we're just seeing variation. Maybe some are smaller and some are bigger um, because we see variation species all the time. 
Um, and then others, a lot of others thought, well, maybe it's the same species, but there's just really extreme sexual dimorphism. The smaller one's the male, the bigger, that's wrong. The smaller one's the female, the bigger one's the male, and that's why they look so different. Because, and I've mentioned this to you guys before, if you were to look at a male gorilla skull and a female gorilla skull, they would look very different. And if you didn't know what a gorilla was, if all you saw that you might think, well, I'm looking at two different species, it takes more information for you to understand what's like the complexity of what's happening. So some people thought maybe that's what they were seeing with this is that, you know, they were in the same regions, overlap in regions, overlap in time. Maybe they were this, just the same species and they just knew we happened to find a female and happened to find a male. However, um, we've talked about this a little bit in this class, but if you look at the picture, there might be a few things that pop out to you. I know there's like a, kind of a grainy photo, but if you look at the one from the side view, hopefully you can kind of see that the brow ridges are really prominent on the smaller one and not as prominent on, sorry, not as prominent on the larger one. There's also some other features that you can't quite see all these photos, but basically, oh my gosh, you guys, basically what I'm trying to hiccups, right? Basically what I'm trying to point out is this idea of sexual dimorphism doesn't really fit with this because it's the smaller one who has all of the more robust features and it's the larger one who has all of the more gracile features, which is just not how sexual dimorphism works at all. So that can't be an explanation. And also, um, I know none of you are like morphologists and it's just this, you know, two dimensional photo, but we do know now, like based on things like the shape of like, you know, this, the, what's called the alveolar region and some other parts of the like face and head that they're clearly functionally different. They're, so now we all understand two different species, but just kind of be aware that sometimes this is what happens in science that you're not really sure because of limited evidence. There's a lot of debate back and forth, which is totally great. And then with evidence comes like more understanding and, and agreeing as a field, like, okay, this is probably what we see now. Like now that there are more, many more specimens, it's, it's much more obvious. But just understand that that was definitely a debate. Okay, slide six, Homo erectus. So you can see, once again, the skull and then that Smithsonian recreation. So now we're definitely starting to see something, you know, we're seeing this trend towards looking a little more like familiar, I should say. Um, still clearly not a human, a Homo sapien, but, but definitely not. Recall those photos, the Smithsonian recreations from like, you know, Austral Australopithecus africanus and, uh, you know, Paranthropus boisea. They looked, you know, quite ancestral. We're not really seeing that. There's so many changes happening with our genus, with the genus Homo. So you can see here in this list of bullet points, um, so the brain is significantly larger now, between 800 and 1,000 cc's. Remember that a um, chimpanzee is around 350 to 400. Um, the Australopithecines for, you know, like 400, 450. Um, Homo habilis a bit bigger, you know, right around 500, a little more than that. But then suddenly with erectus, we see this big jump. Um, but but it, look at the the picture of the skull. So they have some they have some prominent features in like their brow, which is fairly prominent for them. But we even though the brain's getting bigger, it's still what we call long and low. So it's still mostly kind of behind the eyes versus like for a Homo sapien, we see it, a lot of our brain and head is on top. Um, and like I'll tell you right now, we're st we're still not actually sure why. Um, it's probably has to do with the brain and brain growth and regions, regions of the brain, but there's like this, this is still being researched enough for debate um, because there are so many like caveats to that. But if you look at that, so was, like I said, if you look at the photo, you'll see that it's bigger, but we're still seeing more like football shape. So that's interesting. And as far as we know now, there, I will say there is some evidence very recently that might be pointing to this not quite, maybe not being true, but as far as what we all agree on, you know, if you were to ask me like a year ago, I would tell you this now, just so you know, and this is how science works is that people start doing research and, you know, excavating and finding new things. So this might, you know, be changing in textbooks soon. But for now, as far as we know, um, Homo erectus was the first to hom hom hominin to leave Africa. So all these other things are happening in Africa, South Africa, East Africa, you know, Homo erectus, as far as the evidence is pointing to, is the first hominin to actually migrate out of Africa into other parts of the world. Some some populations absolutely stay in Africa, and some go into like parts of Asia and and fairly far. Um, so this is very interesting. Now, don't think of it as because I've heard this. They were much smarter. They must have been like adventurers and travelers. No, 
very likely they were following food because at this time we know that they're starting to uh, eat meat. And so they're very likely following, you know, migrating herds. So it's not, don't rom overly romanticize this idea. Um, that's what was happening, very likely. So the bodies are a little more modern size. So recall that photo I showed you of Lucy compared to a modern human and how even though she was clearly bipedal, um, brain was a little bigger, she was still quite small in, in height. And now we're starting to see like more modern height, uh, more bo modern body mass um, that looks a little more familiar to us. You're like, oh, okay, that I can see as being related to us. It looks more obvious. Not that there's a trend toward being tall. I'm just, you guys understand. I shouldn't have to keep saying that. You guys understand that. Okay, so slide seven. So Homo erectus was known to use this type of tool called Acheulean tools. And now you can see here that also next to the picture of what Homo habilis was using, the old Awan tools. Big difference in these tool types. And there's, trust me, we could have a whole class on tools. We could have a, like four lectures on just Acheulean tools. There's a lot of information, a lot of people researching this, a lot of different ideas and hypotheses about all of this. But what we know at least is one tool type is associated with one species, and another tool type is associated with another. And there are some things that we can definitely know about, some of the basics at least. So if you look at those tools, you might notice, wow, the old one tools look pretty simple. That's true. And the Acheulean tools are a bit more complex. Okay. Um, and this has informed on what we think, how we kind of conceptualize Homo habilis and Homo erectus. And, and also in terms of some of the other evidence of what we know, like they were eating and stuff. So for Homo habilis, they were, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself and make sure if I don't mention it on the next slide. Okay, I do, but I'll start talking about it now. So before I get into that though, okay, so if you're looking at the tools, Oldemorn tools, basically you can make an Oldemorn tool, like take some rocks, break them, pound them into each other, some of them will break, and after some time, very probably very quickly, you'll get one with a sharp edge. You only need a simple tool. And this is the thing I want to make clear to you guys, is with Homo habilis, this doesn't imply that they didn't have the ability to make something more complex. The only thing we really know is that they had this tool for a, hundreds of thousands of years. It worked really well. There was no need to change it. It did the job it needed to do. Um, you might have heard this expression, necessity is the mother of invention. So keep that in mind if you haven't. Basically, there's no need. If you don't need that tool, why would you, why would you spend the time, the energy, looking for that, you know, type of rock, making a way more complex tool, spending, you know, five hours versus five minutes if you don't need it for something specific. There's no need, you know. Um, the tools that Homo habilis were making were perfectly fine, well suited for what they needed them for. And then when um, we see some different shifts in what, in the types of food and, and activities that Homo erectus was doing, it makes sense that we see a more complex tool to fit that scenario. So it doesn't imply that Habilis was stupid and Erectus was really smart. It doesn't imply that based on, based on this. Um, okay, but go to the next slide, so slide eight. So you'll see, I wanna make something clear also, that this is when we do see this transition to, to incorporating some meat in the diet. But I wanna make sure this is, you guys are getting the full story on this. So with the other species, like I told you before, if you look at, even a modern human, if you look at our molars, we have like classic frugivore molars. This is because ancestrally, this is what we're eating, fruits and, you know, plants. And so our molars, the teeth we use to chew are, are adapted for that. And of course we know already that canines and primates have nothing to do with food, so it's pointless to even look at those when you're, you wanna look at the molars. But we do know based on a lot of other evidence that, that this is when, right around, the genus Homo is when we start to see going from like 100% plants for the most part to a, to a transition of incorporating some animal products uh, into the diet. So a couple things is that it wasn't as if suddenly we were we were fruit eaters and then we started hunting animals, not even close. With Homo habilis, we're pretty sure that they were passive scavengers. And if you're unsure about what a scavenger is versus a hunter or passive versus active scavenger, I'll just tell you right now. So basically, a passive scavenger would be, let's say you are just walking through the forest and you come across a carcass that's already been eaten by someone else. And there's maybe some, you know, like a tiny bit of meat left, maybe a little fat, some bones. You just, you get the leftovers basically. But that could, but that could be, and this is what we see with Homo habilis, it could be a, a, um, um, a source of nutrition in, in certain ways that they weren't getting before or just supplement things. 
Um, so even being a passive scavenger can have its benefits. And then, and then you're not having to, you know, chase the animal down yourself and all that stuff. So this is different from active scavenging where you still are kind of waiting for another animal to kill it because maybe like they're better at it or something. Like if you were like, okay, that lion is going to kill the zebra. We're going to let him do that because killing a zebra is really hard. The lion will do it. But now there's like five or six of us. Maybe we can scare that lion away with our fire or whatever. And now we've got the whole zebra versus just like some leftover bones and a couple bites of, of muscle or something. So still not hunting, um, but but definitely a, a transition from, from passive scavenging. Now you're getting way more of, of the dead animal. So we start to see stuff like this, this transition from Homo habilis to Homo erectus. And then with Homo erectus, we're pretty sure they were probably doing like, you know, actual hunting where they themselves would be the ones, you know, going out and um, killing an animal. The other thing I want to make clear is you, it, it's not as if hunting, it's not as if meat is what gave us our big brains. This is a misconception. I want to make sure that you guys understand this, that that's not accurate. Meat did not give us our big brains. Um, so one is that with Homo habilis, they weren't really getting meat as in muscle. They weren't really getting that. What they were getting is something else. Do I have it written down? I do not have it on. Oh, I do. So it says right there at the very bottom, marrow, bone marrow is a, is a rich source of fat. So on an all like, you know, a plant diet, you can get, you can pretty much get everything, but some things are going to be, you know, in smaller amounts than other things. And a large amount of fat that like, let's say you would find in bone marrow is you're not going to have that, you know, in, at least in this area, this region where they were, um, where they were living. So now they have access to a large amount of fat, which is great. And probably a little bit of, you know, the, the meat, which can supplement uh, protein. Um, but I'm sure most of you where you can get more than enough protein from plants. However, given, you know, like that, 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 that's in terms of like our modern world, like being a vegan or vegetarian in the modern world is easy because you, you're not just stuck with what grows around you regionally. We would all, we'd all starve, you know, um, you go to the supermarket, you get stuff from all these different countries. You're like, I can eat, you know, legumes and, you know, dark green vegetables and like, and I get all my protein and all my fat and all my vitamin A and D and what, whatever it is, you know, it's really easy because we live in a especially here we live in a very globalized economy, so that makes it very easy. But at the time, imagine that's not the case. So um, so now they're getting, you know, we're seeing this transition in getting marrow, which is the fat, supplementing a little more protein in the diet. And, but I wanna make sure this is also clear, is you have to have, I don't have that right now, so you have to have something very important to power your brain, um, whether we're talking about Homo erectus, where their brain was still fairly big, or a modern human. Um, your brain uses up, something like 25% of your body's energy, just your brain, just that one thing, 25%. And you have to have something very important and specific to power that big brain. Glucose, glucose. This is what the point I wanna to get to. The reason that we were able to have such big brains, like the evolutionary process, is because we had specifically this great combination of a lot of glucose, for the energy, but also the fat, the protein. It was this great combination of those three things is what allowed, you know, in conjunction with a few other things, allowed that to, to kind of uh, occur in the way that it did. I hope that's clear to you guys. It's not just, oh, meat, big brains, because think about carnivores. Carnivores aren't known for being big brained and intelligent, right? Um, well, smart but I mean to me every animal smart so that's not you know what I mean you know every animal smart in their own way but um, when we think about the animals that tend to be like we were talking about before like cognitively um, more complex we talked about EQ wait do I talk about that with you guys did we talk about that EQ yeah 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 that was your class yeah we talked about like elephants and, and dolphins and primates and so yeah but that was your class I'm pretty sure I hope it was okay um so what we see is a lot of them have like more of a plant-based diet um sometimes often supplemented by other things but like for at least for us in our lineage it's that great combination of glucose and fat and protein it really had to be if we had just switched from eating like we're not eating plants anymore we're just gonna eat these dead animals it probably wouldn't have happened the way it happened it had to really especially for the big brain we really need a lot of this um, so it's really about this great combination. So keep that in mind. The other thing I want to point out is, 
and this is lost on people sometimes too, is that until very recently, like even if you're like, okay, um, it's, it's this great combination, sorry, it's this great combination of glucose and fat and protein. Um, it's often lost on people and forgotten that ancestrally the amount of meat that, whether it's Homo erectus or early humans or whatever, we're eating was a very small amount. So imagine like a, about the size of your fist, like that amount of meat, like once a week, maybe like on average. I mean, regionally there's gonna be some differences, but imagine it's about that. For those of you who eat meat, that's that's probably probably that much a day, right? I'm assuming. Like most of you, if you're eating meat, you're probably eating it fairly often. So evolutionarily, we are adapted really well, um, you know, in these last, you know, a couple hundred thousand years to having smaller packages of meat, um, but I mean, this is a whole argument for like processed foods and whatever, but like the amount of meat that people eat now is not healthy. Um, we're not, well one, we're not adapted to, I mean, think about like the, this is a whole other topic, you guys, but, like the, the way we process our meat, the, how it's injected with all these hormones, um, the, the whole process of factory farming, and we get that product at the end that's just really bad for you, which is why like, um, when you eat like grass fed and stuff like that, it, it is a little bit healthier. When you hunt your own like wild animal, it's gonna be way healthier than anything you'd buy in the supermarket because the animal is, you know, getting exercise, is being injected with hormones. It, the fat, the ratio of like fat to, to muscle is gonna be way healthier for you. So like, this is probably not a surprise to you guys. But anyway, so in terms of like, don't get it confused like, oh, meat gave us big brain, so I need to go to McDonald's. like. The, the, the think about, like I said, this is a whole other topic, but, and actually we'll talk about this later in the semester about culture and food, um, but just kind of think about that, that it's not really equivalent. Um, so in terms of like our ancestry, it was meat, in, in an introduction of meat to the diet, but it was small amounts and it was very healthy amounts, um, or healthy, you know, types um, in, in the diet initially. Okay, so, oh, also the other thing, culturally what's going on with Homo erectus, because at this point we've transitioned to hunting. Now think about what that means for you as a like. Imagine if you are living in a group of like you know 30 people, and 10 of you are like, we're gonna go gather food today, and you're mostly gathering you know like berries and stuff, you know. And then imagine you come across, like I said before, with the um, Homo habilis being passive scavengers. Imagine you come across um, like you know some bones, a little bit of meat. There doesn't need, really need to be a lot of communication going on in the group for you to be like, hmm, I wanna try that, or let's take it back and to camp or something. Um, but the amount of communication that has to occur when you are hunting an animal together as a group, even if it's just two or three of you, there has to be more complex communication going on. And so while this is much harder to get at in terms of like actual like physical evidence, hold on one second. Someone's making a snacking noise back there. Um, it's much harder to get at, like, were they speaking the language um, this early on? It's most anthropologists would say it's probably, there's probably something, even if it's not like complex language the way we understand it now, like the way we use it, there was probably something, some type of verbal communication in some way, probably even some hand signals. Um, so the, the, the amount of communication is is very likely at this point, especially with Homo erectus, um, becoming more complex. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay. So the next one, number slide nine, Homo. You know what? Now that I'm looking through this, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Slide nine. Okay, slide nine. Homo heteroprogensis. Homo heteroprogensis. Um, so like I said, we're just kind of moving through time. So Homo erectus is the first one to leave Africa and moves out to different parts of the world, some in Asia, Africa, North Africa, you know, uh, in the Middle East a, a little bit, but a lot, a lot into Asia, like this kind of this huge range for this area, for this uh, species. So the next species we see is Homo heidelbergensis. And there's some, there's a lot of debate about this. And if we were like in an advanced class, we would spend a lot of time on this. So, um, but just know that the species is heidelbergensis and we see this species in like uh, different parts of like Africa, Northern Africa, uh, some parts of like Southern Europe in this general area of the world. Um, and we also see like the same, some of these same trends we see. 
the brain is even bigger. So now we're seeing 1200 cc's on average. That's fairly close to a modern human, not quite, but not way far off. The, um, the teeth are even smaller. Um, the brow ridge is, is still fairly prominent, like we saw in Homo erectus. You can see in this picture of Cobb. In fact, like that's, I had, can you see this? I can't twist my arm the right way. That is, that's the, um, I have this tattoo. So for my research in paleo, I focus on Heidelbergensis. Well, I, I focus on like a lot of stuff, but like my, my heart will always be in, you know, Heidelbergensis, but, um, but we're seeing some, some definite changes. Like I said, you know, heads, brains are getting bigger, teeth are getting smaller. There's a lot of cranio, like I know from my research, a lot of craniofacial changes, a lot of stuff happening here. We don't really need to get into that for this class, but just know there's definitely a lot going on. It seems like a lot of stuff really changes with in our genus, some big jumps, like brains just get bigger, 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 faces smaller, smaller, smaller. like a lot of stuff is really happening in, in our genus. Um, it's very interesting. And, oh, real quick, um, just so you know some of the terms I realized. So ancestral versus derived on on, on slide nine. Um, so ancestral just means, you know, like you guys probably know what that means, like from in the past, things you share with other species. Derived means something new. So for example, like hominins are, are that big long lineage. Bipedalism was a derived feature. So that was a new like physical feature that happened. Um, it wasn't before it happened then versus like an ancestral trait would be like opposable thumbs like we had them now we had them then you know it wasn't new or something like that if that, if that makes sense to you guys so with like i said with heidelbergensis we see this mixture of still ancestral features of course you're going to always see that ancestral features and then some interesting new ones the same thing with neanderthals so go to slide 10 you'll see homo neanderthalensis or neanderthal it is not Neanderthal. It has never been Neanderthal. Do not pronounce it Neanderthal. It's Neanderthal. Um, sometimes you'll see the Neanderthal spelled with a T. Sometimes you'll see it with a TH. It doesn't matter. It's still Neanderthal. Okay. Um, and you'll see from the picture of the Smithsonian recreation. Oh, and the one for Heidelbergensis this was pretty good too. But now, now they've you know taken a little bit of artistic license, but we know they're living in more cold regions. So we talked about this before a little bit with um, closeness to the equator and skin tone. So they're probably fairly accurate in the, in the skin tone and stuff like that they have um, in, the, in the recreation. So now we have even different tools with um, Neanderthals, Mysterian tools. There's a picture of it there. And you can see from the picture of the skull that, um, you know, it's kind of hard. It's not quite like a side view, but their brains are quite large. Um, in fact, do I not have that picture here? Why is that not here? Uh, oh, okay, it's coming up on the next slide. Okay, their brains are really big. But you can see on the picture of just the skull on slide 10 that the eyes are, you know, they look pretty big, right? The nasal opening is huge. Um, and you can't quite tell from this picture, but their, their maxilla and their zygomatic is very different. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on with, with Neanderthals. So go to the next slide, a little more on Neanderthals. Oh, and, oh wait, real quick, go back to slide 10, that last point. So Neanderthals were the first hominin discovered. So of course, not including Homo sapiens, because people were probably digging up Homo sapiens all the time. But in terms of like any non-Homo sapien hominin in that whole lineage, it, the very first one was a Neanderthal. And in fact, when they first found this, they thought, well, this looks really similar to a human, but it's obviously different. And they thought it was like some human with a disease uh, which is why the skull looked so weird, and, the, and and it wasn't until a little later that they realized, no, this is, you know, this is something else. And then, of course, they found more, and, you know, but just know that. Okay, so slide 11. So some more features about the Neanderthal. There are a lot of features I've listed. Don't stress about knowing each one of them, so I'll point out a couple. So the first is that second one down, large brain, 1,500 cc's. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, didn't she say that a modern homo sapien is like 14 to 1450 cc's, I did. It's because Neanderthals had the largest brain of any hominin, the largest brain of any hominin. Now, in referencing that idea of EQ or encephalization quotient, in terms of like looking at brain size to body size and what that tells you, might tell you a little more information about like cognition or intelligence, like from what we at least understand it now. Um, humans, our EQ is a little higher. So you're like, well, their brains are bigger but our EQ is like whatever, it's not, it's not a contest, right? But just know, for whatever weird misconception that Neanderthals had small brains, like I know the reason why all this happened, you know, but um, we're not gonna get into that whole debate. But um, it's not accurate at all. In fact, we know they probably had a very rich culture based on a lot of evidence. They were had a 
large brain larger than humans. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I have this next one, number three down, uh, ad adapted for glacial climates, because this is not accurate. It might, I don't even know if they say it in this way in your textbook, I'd have to double check, uh, but I know in the previous textbook I used for a class, like when I was teaching, that they used this still. I'm like, it's wrong, it's definitely wrong. That is, we in, in our field know this is wrong. Sometimes it takes the textbooks a while to kind of catch up with the new research, which is very frustrating. Um, but classically, this was the idea that Neanderthals lived in this very glacial environment. It was cold, it was mountainous. Um, all of these really, really unique and specific features that Neanderthals had must have been an adaptation to that cold environment. Like I said before, we always have this romanticized idea, like everything has to be explained by natural selection. When in fact, there are four other forces of evolution at work, genetic drift, gene flow, you know, all those, sexual selection. So what we know now based on research is that, because a lot of times it was assumed, people would say, well, like one of the, one of the classic ideas was, well, the nose must be really big to warm the really cold air. And if you didn't really think too much into that, you might think, huh, okay, that sounds okay. But then you really start picking it apart and start even thinking about like just modern human populations about, well, those who live in cold environments don't have big noses. Those who live in warm environments tend to. Hmm. Not that that means it's for sure, like not true about Neanderthals. But then people started actually researching it. Like, hmm, I'm gonna look at, you know, rabbits in all over the world in cold and warm environments, different elevations, and like, all these different mammal studies, none of it was fitting. And so in the last few years, everyone's like, that doesn't explain it at all. In fact, it's the opposite. Big nose can't be explained by the cold weather. The 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 maxillary sinuses can't be explained by the cold weather. The, the very, for the picture, the, the teeth and the jaw can be explained by the, like none of it really can be explained by the cold weather. So cold weather, this idea of like adapted for cold weather or glacially, like it's not a thing, just so you know that. And these are a lot of those features that you can see in the, in the bullet point list. And that the one pictured is, um, called the retromolar space. So if you look at the teeth, you'll see like, so this part of your jaw is called the ascending ramus. And typically when you take any like mandible, like a hominin, and you turn it on its side like that, and you're looking at it from the side, that last tooth or the third molar, the ramus kind of starts like right after that, like the way our teeth are situated in our jaw. But for Neanderthals, there's a big gap. Like there's this interesting extension or something going on of, of that. And so we don't really know why, but we know it when we see it, we're like, that's a Neanderthal. You could just have literally like a fragment of the jaw and you'd be like Neanderthal. It's a very specific feature to them. So very interesting. Okay, moving on to slide 12. Um, this is just, there's a little bit of research into um, Neanderthal language. There are a couple of genes because we've been able to sequence their DNA that for Neanderthals, there are a few genes that we know are related to like language. Um, so like, you know, Time will tell on this one, but just know that it's, it is an area of research, seems to be kind of pointing in that direction. And like I said before, that with Homo erectus, which was before Neanderthal, um, we, they probably had something. And so Neanderthals probably, they were hunting too. They probably had some form of communication. So if you've ever seen, there's this movie, there was a book series like in the 80s and a movie called Clan of the Cave Bear. Um, if you, like it's, it's for entertainment, so don't think it's accurate, but, they do, like, there's this, I remember this one scene where, like, because basically it's about this group of Neanderthals. There's a little human girl and her family gets killed. And so the Neanderthal family, like, takes her in. And they're like, oh, my gosh, she's so smart because she can count to ten. And they can only, like, count to six or something. I don't know. I'm making it sound silly. Like, it's 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 good. It's, it's a little older movie and it's based on, like I said, a book series. But um, interesting. But, you know, some of the, like I said, we'll never really know. We can make some really good assumptions and even based on some solid evidence that they probably had language but some of those things some of those cultural experiences unless we have a time machine it's gonna be harder to get at the way we can get at like you know having a bone in front of us be like oh that's a female you know so it's a little bit harder it can be done to an extent okay so slide 13 um, but then this is just to point out some of the cultural things about Neanderthals so Neanderthals um, buried their dead in deliberate positions um often with like decorating the graves now think about this what this means so like we know that other mammals are really smart and we know that they mourn when like their their offspring dies or when a family member dies especially like dolphins and, and elephants and pigs like we know that they're really intelligent dog dogs even you know we understand like they understand something has happened 
and um, and we could say, well, elephants probably understand more than dogs. Like, but even humans have a hard time conceptualizing death and all that. So it's it's already a complex issue. But imagine, like, if I asked you, like, what do you do? Like, say someone in your family has passed away. What do you do? Well, I'm gonna get like ten different answers. Like, there's a whole process, right? Like, okay, well, are they at the hospital? You probably have them transferred to like a mortuary. Um, maybe you have them cremated. Um, maybe there's a funeral of some sort, or maybe there's a celebration, depending on the religion that might be, you know, last for a certain period of time or longer. Uh, family is there. Sometimes it's, you know, you play their favorite music. Like the, like the list goes on, right? That we have a whole cultural process built around when someone has passed away in, in so many different, you know, interesting and beautiful, complex ways. And we, I think we tend to think like that's something unique to humans because if you were like outside and you saw like, um, dogs like circling around another dead dog and then like burying it and then picking a flower and putting it like you'd be like whoa something's going on you you would probably think like that's crazy but you would think that dog's really smart you, you imply something about them cognitively or intellectually because of their ability to have a kind of more of a ritual cultural process if that makes sense to you guys so this is what we're getting at with the Neanderthals that they were doing this um, and so that implies something about who they were culturally. Did, you know, did they have early forms of religion? You could probably make an argument for that. Did they have an understanding of, of an afterlife in whatever way they thought that, that what that was? You know, very likely, because why, why else go through that process if you didn't at least imagine something beyond something um, in some way? Or even at a minimum, even if you don't, you don't think they had a religion, they at least had the ability to recognize death in a very interesting cultural social way so just know that we see this with neanderthals and we hadn't seen it before this slide 14 you just see some of the graves were like dyed with um red uh dye so that's interesting like was that meaningful to that person who passed was it meaningful to the people who who did it because this is the other thing too like often when we call them grave goods people put things in, in graves or in like even now people do it like say a friend of yours passed you might you know put in something into their into their um casket that's really important but does it say more about you who put it in or does it say more about them uh, the person who died so that's like a conundrum right so it's interesting to think about but so we see at least that this kind of mental process is going on with neanderthals and then of course slide 15 we see evidence of shells and other things that have holes in them it's been implied that maybe this was they were using it as jewelry like they were stringing you know like a string through it of some sort that just didn't preserve over time and then if that's if that's accurate then that is a whole world of like cultural richness like adorning your body decorating your body um like did it have a special significance in terms of like status in the community was it males or females did they do different things like it's just it's so interesting so something to think about but i will say because I was talking to my advisor about this the other day, he was like, well, definitely mention, you know, um, this, like, uh, an interesting thing about this, though, is we see a lot of the stuff in Neanderthals happening after they come in contact with modern humans. Most of it, at least. So, is that just what the evidence is pointing to, and it's not the full story? Is that accurate? You know, it's one of those things, like, we need more evidence to know. But based on what we're seeing so far, that's interesting like so maybe their cultural experience was very simple or limited and after meeting a very culturally rich you know the homo sapiens and they're like oh we can do that stuff too now that still implies they had the ability they just hadn't been introduced to the idea so they still had the mental ability you know like and, and cultural ability to do that um but the, so that that's interesting to think but at the same time like when we see even for modern humans we see one cultural doing one like population doing something one way and another population doing something one way we definitely don't imply the other one's dumb because they didn't do it the other way that the other group is doing it, right? So just think about that. Yeah. Okay. Slide 16. <clears throat> you will see um, just like a, the, the picture of like the different hominids. You'll see some of the, hi the height differences and the size differences and, you know, down from like, you know, um, the Homo sapiens to the Neanderthal to like, you know, the Erectus and the, and the different features of them. Okay, so slide 17. So we're, we're not gonna talk about Homo sapiens, we're gonna talk about that in the next one. But I wanted to talk to you about another one, a couple different things. Something called, a species called Homo floresiensis. So hold on one second. So this was discovered in 2005, six? Recently, 
I remember when I took this class, you know, like years ago, it, it was like a really recent thing. It was only a couple years old. Homo floresiensis, a lot of interesting stuff going on in this. So it was discovered on the island of Flores, hence the name, um, but dated to only about 18,000 years ago. So very recent. So this species was existing at the same time in the same area as Homo sapiens. Ve and very recently, not like oh, a long time ago, like very, very recently. Um, they've been kind of nicknamed the Hobbit. So if you ever hear that term, like the Hobbit, obviously not like the book or the movie, but like in terms of like paleoanthropology research, it's referencing Homo floresiensis. They were very short, only about three and a half feet tall. Now we only have one individual, like one full individual. There are some other bones of some other individuals, but a lot of it's like still currently being excavated. Um, but there's been so much re really interesting research dedicated to this. And go to slide 18. So the initial debate was that, okay, there's just one. It looks kind of like a human, but it's really small and the brain is small. It must just be a small human who you know had some um, disease, probably some form of microcephaly. So microcephaly is basically like the brain is small and it can be small for different reasons and in different areas depending on unfortunately like a number of different like you know diseases. Uh, but basically the brain is severely underdeveloped and that person is you know underdeveloped in like cognitively. However, when actually doing research, it, they realized this wasn't quite fitting um, and it was probably something called island dwarfing that was happening. So go to slide 19. So what we see, so island dwarfing, what we see, this happening with animals on islands. Islands are a really unique ecological um, experience. Mammals tend to get smaller. Like we have a very finite amount of resources. We're like, okay, there's not a lot of food. I need to consume 2,000 calories a day but to survive and thrive. But so-and-so only needs to, to consume a thousand calories a day to survive and thrive. Who do you think is probably going to do better when there's a limited number amount of food, right? So this is what we see with, with larger mammals. They tend to be smaller on islands. And then because mammals are smaller, other animals that might have been like, where the mammal might have been a predator, we see bugs and other things like in like lizards and stuff getting bigger. So it's this really interesting, like, you know, difference between those two. So this was what we've pretty much assumed now. It's probably um, island dwarfing because, go to slide 20, slide 20, um, there was, and here's like a book recommendation for you if you were interested. Uh, I read this years ago when I was an undergrad, so it's not like a difficult read if you're interested. You're like, hmm, this Floresiensis thing is kind of interesting. Um, and some of the Austral for the scene stuff they talk about. Uh, this really good book called or, uh, The Fossil Chronicles. But in this book, and this is what the picture is, there was a lot of research done on this. Okay, comparing, and you can see in this picture, the, the, the brain in the middle is Homo Floresiensis, and you have four others on the side, right? The one on the bottom is a chimpanzee. The one on the top is a homo sapien. The one on the left is a homo sapien with microcephaly. And then the one on the right is homo erectus. Now, if you're just, just visually, like they did a bunch of fancy math on this, but look, just visually, which one does it look more similar to? If you're thinking it looks more similar to the homo erectus, you're right. And mathematically, this is accurate. So what we're, what paleoanthropologists mostly now, what we think is, because we know Homo erectus was migrating into different areas of the world, especially into Asia, that there must have just been a small population that ended up on this island. You know, as the rest of hominins were evolving into something else, this one evolved on just in this little area um, because of island dwarfing evolved into Homo floresi flore yeah, floresiensis into, you know, very modern times. So, like I said, we only really have like one full individual and like some other specimens, um, some other pieces of another individual. Um, and there seems to be what appears to be tools, not right with them, but fairly close. So um, it's, like I said, fairly recent. And so in the next, hopefully in like five or 10 years, we'll get some really great information about this, but just know like this is a very recent thing. And this is one of the great things about, you know, science is that at any point someone can find something new and you're like, oh my gosh, because we have been thinking for years. It's just been homo sapiens for, you know, like 40,000 years since Neanderthals and whoa, 18,000 years ago, that's like really recent. So who knows what else we'll find. Okay, and then if you go to slide 21, you will see the Smithsonian recreation of that first individual. And they know she was a female, so very interesting. Okay, slide 22, the Piltdown hoax. So you might have heard about this before, in fact, so I'll tell you, my my friend, this was 
like a year ago, a little over a year ago, was like, hey, have you ever heard of the show Drunk History? And I was like, yes, I have. It's hilarious. I, and I'll tell you right now, if you have never heard of the show, please watch it. It's hilarious. You will learn something and you'll laugh at the same time. So basically the premise of the show Drunk History is that they get like comedians, um, they prep them a little beforehand. Like they give them like a story they have to tell. And they say, okay, you know, this is the story you have to tell on, you know, on the show. And um, you hit these main points. And um, they make them tell the story a bunch of times while they're drunk. And so it's the slow progression of, you know, them drinking throughout the night and telling a story. Now, in the show, you only see, like, you see, like, a like, 20-minute episode or something. Um, and they obviously edit it so it's not, like, seven hours long. It's, you know, like, whatever. Um, but I have been looking into the background of this because she's like, I was thinking of doing something called Drunk Anthropology. And I was like, I'm in. <laughs> and so she's like, okay, well, why don't we do an audio? She wanted to do, like, a computer animation instead of, like, a recreation with actors, obviously. Um, and so oh, that's the other thing if you haven't seen the show they do recreation with the actors This is what makes it so funny. It's not just someone telling a story drunk, but you're like I get that all the weekend, you know um, It's someone's telling a story drunk and then they use their exact narration of slurred words and you know mispronunciations and the actors are like Voice like moving their mouths to this dial. It's just it's hilarious. It's so hilarious Anyway, she was like, well, you know, we obviously can't do actors and stuff, but we'll do like a uh, um what did I say? An animation on, on the computer, but we'll do an audio. So she's like, okay, we're gonna drink. Or she's like, you'll drink. And um, she had like one drink with me and then I just kept drinking. And she's like, well, t t tell the story at least five times. I was like, okay. And so she's like, you can pick the story. What do you think is gonna be a good one for anthropology? I'm like, tilt down. She's like, oh my God, yes. And so if, you, if, you, if you've heard this story, you know it's like a great story. It's a really important story. This is what I wanna tell you guys, okay. Um, so as you can see here on the bullet points, um, in 1912, some fossil fragments were found in England by someone named Richard, I'm sorry, Charles Dawson. And Dawson was an amateur archaeologist. And like basically what that means, it's like he'd like to dig stuff up and be, tell his like science friends like, hey, look what I found, you know? And like it's a lot of, I should say a lot of people did this, you know, now we have a lot of like accreditation processes, but it wasn't really the same back then. Anyway, now remember this is so important is the culture of the time is the scientists, you know, academia, they didn't have a lot of fossils, hardly, especially of anything in our lineage. Um, in fact, what did they have in 1912? Just a few things, like a Neanderthal and a couple other, like not a lot. And so imagine someone told you, you had no information, someone told you, hey, we evolved, we shared a common ancestor with chimps 6,000 years ago. You're like, okay. And we want you to guess what has happened in those six million years? They're like, okay, I can maybe do that. You would, if I asked 10 different people, we'd probably get 10 different answers, right? If you had no fossil evidence to go on. So this is what a lot of them were, it was just pure conjecture. And some of it was maybe even based on like some logic that you could say, okay, that kind of makes sense. With it, since they had no fossil evidence, you could think, okay, that kind of makes sense. So they had these preconceived notions, but they were also preconceived for other reasons too. So what they thought, of course, these white European men thought, well, Europeans are the best, so we're definitely gonna find a lot of, you know, human lineage in Europe because, well, humans are the better animal and Europeans are the better humans, so we're definitely gonna find a lot of stuff in Europe. Well, we know now, like, some stuff is in Europe, but it's really not until later. The majority of the human evolution was in Africa, so they were wrong about that. And they also thought, well, our big brains as humans is what sets us apart from the animals. So big brains must have been like the primary thing that separated us. We're gonna see big brains like kind of right away in that lineage. Well, of course we know that's wrong. Brains got a little bigger slowly and it wasn't really until very recently that we see this big jump in brain size. So they were wrong about that. Um, and we know it's, it's we, were, we were fully bipedal, modern height and body size before our brains even got to modern size. Like, so we looked for the most part like, fully human um, before we had the very large brain. And they thought it was gonna be the opposite. They thought it would see like an ape-like kind of like quadruped with a big brain. Like they, they totally had it wrong. But they didn't have anything to go on. But also they had some very, you know, um, uh, racist, you know, preconceptions that were wrong. Anyway, so when Charles Dawson's like, hey, I found some bones in uh, England. I'm pretty sure they're in our lineage. Everyone was like, oh, he must be right. And a lot of it wasn't questioned. And this is why I'm telling you guys the story is like, we don't do this now. And this is why, um, 
hold on a second. My computer's like plugging me in. Okay. Um, but people wanted to believe this, especially, especially like now science is very open access. Like, what'd you find? Better let me see it or it doesn't count. Like, for the most part. A lot of stuff back then, it was like, I found something, you, only two people can look at it, and I'm gonna put it in this glass case and no one can touch it. Like, it was just a very different process back then. But anyway, so he finds this, and he calls his friend, Arthur Woodward, who works at the, what was it, like, Natural History Museum, and it's like, I found this thing, like, you know, come look at it, I'm pretty sure, and, and, and Arthur was like, hmm, it like, could be, you know, and then Ar Woodward was like, staying there, helping him excavate, and then, you know, Dawson, of course, when no one else was around, found more evidence, found tools, found some other bones, and, uh, like, I'm saying this now, like, you know, like this, because we know so much now of the story, that, like, later, but anyway. So the skull was deemed to be, it must be a human, or like a human ancestor of some sort, but it had a very large brain, it had a large mandible, and it had ape-like teeth. So right now, hopefully you're, you're recalling some of the things I talked about. We lost those ape-like teeth really early on, like the, the larger canine and the diastema, the CP3 honing complex, hominins don't have that. We lost that right away. Mandibles, depending on the species, some of the offshoots, like the evolution trajectories, like for like poranthropines, for example, very large mandible. Um, but not ape-like teeth in that mandible, though. They were just giant molars. And large brains, like, we don't see any of these things in combination with, like, it's just, it's just wrong. It just doesn't work. But they didn't have anything else, so of course they're like, that seems fine. Why would we think otherwise? Go to the last slide, slide 23. Um, so I already kind of said that first part. But so it wasn't until, it was like the 1949 that some, some um, because now, over a couple, a few decades, they have, Scientists have started starting to find, you know, morning Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Australopithecines, and at first those, a lot of those finds, those early finds, are like disregarded, and but then suddenly there's an accumulation of them, and people are like, wait a minute, okay, we thought Piltdown was was right, and so we disregarded some of those other finds, like the erectus thing, we disregarded as something else, but now there's so many, and they all seem to be kind of fitting into this very similar story. It was a limited story for them because they didn't have as much as we have now. But it was still filling everything. It was like, okay, you know, bipedalism, the brains are getting a little bigger, but still kind of small, this trend toward... And it wasn't until like 1949 that people were like, wait a minute, Piltdown's the odd one out. This one just doesn't fit. Everything else that we have now, even though like we have so much more like now we do in 2020, like they didn't, in, you know, seven years ago, but they still have more. They realized that Piltdown was the odd one out. And so these researchers were like, you know, let's go, let's actually take the Piltdown skull out. Let's take some measurements, let's do some examination because no one literally had done this. And um, they realized without even having to really do anything that it was a total scam, that someone had stained the bone to make it look older with like tea to make it look older. The mandible was, um, Part of like was an orangutan mandible and the teeth and there had been like the teeth and like jaw had been filed to make them to make it fit like right and like there was even like apparently they even found like remnants of some types of glue like holding the teeth in like it was just like if anyone had taken like 20 minutes to look at it 40 years before it would have saved so many people so many of these really great researchers like eugene dubois and raymond dart and some of these other ones who came later were like, I found this, I found this. And they're like, nope, doesn't fit with our narrative. We have built down. And so it's just it's just a sad story, uh, you know, for these people, but also for science in general, though it took decades for us to be like, oh, like, whoops, you know. Um, and so everyone was like, people were like, oh, this makes sense. But everyone was like, what the fuck, you know? Why, you know, so by then Dawson was dead. And now, like, you can Google this. There's like so many different conspiracy theories about like, was it just him? Was it a hoax? gone wrong was it like a or like a practical joke gone wrong was it him trying to like you know become a prominent in this field or he was like an amateur um were there were there these was it more of like a racial spin on it or a class spin on like so many different ideas um but the bottom line is that it was a hoax no one bothered to correct it for 40 years when it probably could have been done people had these horrible preconceived notions of humans being better than other animals for whatever reason, Europeans being better than other groups for obviously incorrect reasons, and it, and they let their personal bias get into the science too much, and then it ended up delaying, like stagnating our field for, for many decades. So it's a really cool story. Like like I said, if you're interested in it, it would actually be a really cool like paper, 
Oh, you guys aren't doing the paper. Never mind. That's my other class. Sorry. <laughs> Don't panic. You're not. You're. You're not doing a research paper for this class. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I think that's it. And I'll see you guys in the next one.